Welcome back to this series on the Tao Te Ching, where we're going over each individual chapter of Taoism's most important text. So if you're new here, I recommend going to my channel where I have all the videos in a playlist up to date and in an order for you to watch. So without further delay, reading from the Jafu Feng and Jane English translation of the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, here is chapter 15. The ancients were subtle, mysterious, profound, responsive. The depth of their knowledge is unfathomable. Because it is unfathomable, all we can do is describe their appearance, watchful as though crossing a winter stream, alert like people aware of danger, courteous like visiting guests, yielding like ice about to melt, simple like uncarved blocks of wood, hollow like caves, opaque like muddy pools. Who can wait quietly while the mud settles? Who can remain still until the moment of action? Observers of the Tao do not seek fulfillment. Not seeking fulfillment, they are not swayed by desire for change. So in the first part here, the ancients were subtle, mysterious, profound, responsive. The depth of their knowledge is unfathomable. Because it is unfathomable, all we can do is describe their appearance. So up to this point in the Tao Te Ching, we've been talking about you know, the Tao with some glimpses of the wise and the ancients like mentioned here. And like always, we need to understand the language when we have the ancients or the wise. The wise, like I described in a previous chapter, is like those who follow the Tao. But the ancients might be a little bit different and it is, you know, kind of up to interpretation. You know, it depends on which translation you're reading. The ancients could be referring to our ancestors that had that what is referred to here as subtlety that caused our lineage to develop such ways of thinking and being. Ancients could even mean the earth itself, nature itself, as the ancient ancestor, as we are nature, of course. And I think it's a mix of all the things that came before us that have led us up to this point. Whatever is part of the tree of life you know, that is all, those are the ancients. You know, you consider the roots of the tree, maybe it's the unseen, but all that came before, before us is directly in line with the Tao. As we are as well, we just need to recognize it because the ancients here are being described because they were in line with the Tao. So there is a thin line here that's being drawn between the ancients and the Tao, kind of like the wise, and the Tao, and of course, you could assume here that they're one in the same, as we are one in the same. Now here's the kicker, because they are so in line with the Tao, all we can really do, because, you know, think about chapter one, you know, words and labels are silly, they don't do it justice, all we can really do to understand them with our um, limited human perception is to describe their appearance, right? That's all we can really do, especially, you know, as, as we are the, you know, the life forces that animate these bodies, that's all that we can really do. And I love the language here because it sounds like a throwback, like I said, uh, to chapter one, you know, about uh, the Tao that cannot be told is not the eternal Tao. The words do not do it justice. You know, all we can, all we can do is describe it with words or describe their appearance. Watchful as though crossing a winter stream. Alert like people aware of danger. Courteous like visiting guests yielding like ice about to melt. It's like poetry. So here we have more parallels and metaphors for the Tao in, in this kind of explanation that's actually a little bit more friendly, you know, to human understanding. Because uh, like I said, you know, and I've said this a million times, you know, people have this idea that, um, you know, Taoism is the stare at the wall, do nothing kind of um, ideology or philosophy or whatever. And it's just like, you, you even read the Tao Te Ching, it's like, this stuff is for us. Because it's like, okay, great. You can talk about, okay, it's the unknown. Okay, then what? Are we just supposed to say, well, it's all unknown. It's like, yeah, of course it's all unknown. But we still have um, an intellect, you know, we still have this part of us that thinks and everything. And like I said, in, uh, you know, other chapters, this awareness is so important, you know, understanding and having a pursuit of knowledge is not like, it doesn't make you a hypocrite, you know, it doesn't immediately make you out of line with the spiritual path. I think a lot of people who kind of think in this way are kind of adopting that strictness that comes with a lot of religion and philosophy and rules and things have to be right, you know, by the rules and everything. And it's like, 
this is all about non-duality, amorality, okay? Like, and a human is a human the same way as a tree is a tree, okay? Trees grow in weird ways, okay? You're not going to point and say, well, this tree is being a hypocrite. It doesn't work like that. And so we're being drawn to <clears throat> these kinds of behaviors that we can actually practice to at least help us understand the essence. Because imagine being in, so in tune with the Tao. I think of these monks and these, uh, you know, uh, these priests, you know, all these religious figures that are so in tune with the infinite, you know, that like described here, that they like always acting uh, cautiously, you know, towards the world as though they were always crossing a stream, being alert of all threats, but nice enough to be like a guest in one's home uh, and not so eager, but slow like ice melting to me a lot of these attributes it really personally it reminds me of like a, an innocent deer like alert cautious um you know but like courteous and graceful in how it naturally behaves again going back to nature right and i really love the language here and this really stuck out to me the 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 part about um courteous like visiting guests and you know i really think about how this whole idea with attachment right um the reason why we have a lot of attachment is that you know we're so attached to this this blip we have this this existence that we have on earth but ultimately we are guests here you know we're here for a very short period of time and you know we are these life forces that animate the body and because and you, you'll hear me say this a billion times but um because energy cannot be destroyed it can only be transformed whatever this life force does after, you know, this body, we don't know, but um, we are ultimately guests here in these bodies on this earth even. Literally, like this place we exist, you know, these bodies that we have animated or rather we're not intentionally animating it, you know, because nobody said I'm going to be born as a baby right now. Um, we're only here for a very, very, very tiny blip. And you could easily say that this is not really our home, whatever this life animating force is that we are. It's not our home, it is more so like a hotel room. And this metaphor of the hotel room is so brilliantly explained by uh, Imam Omar Suleiman. Uh, and as I paraphrase, you know, what he kind of said, this really, really stuck with me. It was so brilliantly said that not to be so attached, you know, to the physical things of this world, like buying furniture for a nice hotel room no matter how nice the hotel room is you need to remember that you're only there for a very short period of time i absolutely love this metaphor and in this way we are courteous and humble and not attached to the physical world because we're going to be going pretty soon and we can't take any of this with us physically speaking in this way we are courteous alert and yielding as we continue with more lessons from nature right so simple like uncarved blocks of wood, hollow like caves, opaque like muddy pools. Furthering from the previous lines, you know, being true and unchanged like an uncarved block of wood. You've heard me mention this before in these videos. Now it's hard to be truly uncarved, right? And you have to, we have to take all of this with a grain of salt, right? Because we are born into this world, we are affected by you know, our parents, how we're raised, the friends we have around us, our environment, this and that. It is like, feels kind of impossible, you know, to be an uncarved block, you know, even, um, you know, maybe these mystics and yogis who really renounce everything and, and, and maybe they get to the point, but like for the average person, um, to be like an uncarved block is like nearly impossible. So we need to not take this in such a logical and literal sense and understand the uncarved block is kind of a reminder of what we were kind of coming into this world and that is our true authentic self because as the world carves us left and right which it will you know inevitably we can't really go back necessarily to how we were but it all starts with just becoming aware of the idea of the uncarved block and in a similar way you know i've heard people say that there was no that the only true Christian was Jesus Christ, right? 
and you know this whole idea in christianity that we're all sinners it's like we're never going to be perfect right but jesus christ is kind of like that uncarved block you know he's like the example that we have to be aware of and kind of channel and this is kind of the same thing with lao tzu lao tzu we don't even really know if he was a real person you know even if you know anything about the the story of how this was written you know it's like there's really no actual proof or anything it's more of a legend but regardless, Lao Tzu is this kind of legendary figure, this uncarved block in human form kind of thing, as he's the one credited with the Tao Te Ching. And we have to be careful because um, a lot of people have this association, right, with their experiences. So we need to understand the point of, like, the uncarved block metaphor. Because one could say, you know, my past is my past. I cannot change that, you know. And it's like, just like I said, you know, life is going to carve us. Exactly. You cannot change that. But your choice is whether you allow that, you know, these experiences or not to define you and to not allow your personality to be ingrained with the carvings and say, I am these carvings. These carvings make me who I am. So it all comes back to the perspective and the identification you have with your experiences or carvings rather, which is ultimately what makes the difference. And like I said, nobody can become an uncarved block, okay? Like the same way that there can, there can never really be a true understanding of, of non-duality or the Tao, right? But this is all about gutting out the identification and the experiences that seem to have a lock on our conscious or most likely also our subconscious, you know? And with that, to be hollow like a cave, not being filled to the brim, right? That's another throwback to a previous chapter. And unpredictable and mysterious like a muddy pool. You know, how many people have you met who may think that they're so, you know, unique and self-driven and unbeknownst to them, they're like one of the most predictable people you've ever met and most of their ideas aren't even theirs? The least predictable people are kind of the Stoics. They are kind of like the muddy pools. And trying to figure them out is kind of like looking into a muddy pool. But of course, like, wouldn't, wouldn't a muddy pool, wouldn't that be a bad thing? Don't I want my pool to be clear? You know, it may be muddy to others. And honestly, if some people, you know, that might be more of the mud in their pool than it is yours, right? But in our spiritual practice, we're being called, as Lao Tzu asks in this next part here, who can quietly, who can wait quietly while the mud settles? Who can remain still until the moment of action? Observers of the Tao do not seek fulfillment. Not seeking fulfillment, they are not swayed by desire for change. And so after all these examples, Lao Tzu asks, so who's going to be the one or the ones who actually wait quietly, being still until the right moment of action? And this is the key to the authentic self, right? Like people have all these self-help books and these solutions and this and that and that. You have to wake up at 4 a.m. and do this. All, all the past carvings that, you know, you've accumulated within the muddy pools, you know, waiting for all that to settle through silence and acceptance and understanding, listening to the universe, right? And a great way to understand the silence and this kind of patience that Lao Tzu is calling for is to look to author and philosopher Jason Gregory, who brilliantly explains this in a more scientific context that we can all understand. Quote, the spiritual path of Buddhism came into existence as a result of this yearning to completely slow down our nervous system so we can experience real freedom. In Sanskrit, such freedom is called nirvana meaning extinction, freedom from suffering, and ultimately the unconditioned eternal reality that we experience as enlightenment. Whether knowingly or unknowingly, Gautama the Buddha accessed a part of our nervous system that remains dormant when we are always in physical and mental motion. This part of our nervous system is known as the parasympathetic nervous system. The automatic nervous system is our central focus when related to psychological or spiritual inner work and transformation. The automatic nervous system has two branches, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is sometimes considered the fight or flight system because it is activated in cases of emergencies to mobilize energy. It is what we activate when we are in motion and being stimulated through our senses. Without it, we could not do anything. 
The parasympathetic nervous system, on the other hand, is often considered the rest and digest or feed and breed system because it is activated when we are in a relaxed state. We activate the parasympathetic nervous system when we essentially do nothing. The parasympathetic nervous system is what makes us drift off to sleep every night. It is stimulated most when we relax deeply. The war on our nervous system is essentially the overstimulation of our sympathetic nervous system along with an understimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. When we stimulate only the sympathetic nervous system without activating the parasympathetic nervous system, we increase the probability of chemical imbalances in our brain from not having a healthy, balanced lifestyle. Because of this, the vast majority of us are teetering on the edge of psychological suicide. This is from the book Fasting the Mind by Jason Gregory, Chapter 2, War on the Nervous System. And I put that in because Jason really just explains it just so perfectly, um, you know, so it's better to just giving you that quote instead of regurgitating it myself. And so a lot of this stuff, of course, you're going to hear me say this, uh, you know, a million times. It's easier said than done, right? But you think about how a lot of this applies to modern society and everything with our phones and, you know, we have 10 cups of coffee and, you know, I'm exaggerating, you know, we work 10 hours and this and that. And it's just like, that's all sympathetic nervous system. We don't really give time for a parasympathetic nervous system. And that's when meditation comes in. That's when putting the phone away before bed comes in. Um, so everything that we kind of have, you know, at least in America, I'll speak for America. Um, everything is kind of this, you know, get the next thing, get the next thing. Everything's an advertisement. Um, and it really is just a huge like culture around the neglect of the parasympathetic nervous system and this is also why you know like Jason kind of hints you know in his book that this is kind of why we have a lot of chemical imbalances you know a growing rate of depression and everything the correlation between you know the the overstimulation of the sympathetic through technology social media uh, correlates you know with the rising rate of suicide and depression so Anyway, to close, again, another echo from past chapters, do not seek fulfillment, right? Because if you're seeking a goal, you will be swayed by desire. Think about how if you're on the spiritual path and then you're faced with certain values from society, certain things that are considered important, body image, job status, income figures, you know, social media likes, whatever it may be, you attach yourself with the accomplishment of those things and you'll easily sweep yourself, you know, away from you know, this path from the spiritual path. So easier said than done, you know, like I live in America and, you know, I have my spiritual practice, but it's like, hey, it's it's not easy, right? It's like, uh, especially when, like I said, this culture is kind of constantly driving you in, you know, constantly driving your parasympathetic nervous system, you know, your dopamine, everything's got to be a little dopamine hit, right? So being an uncarved block, you know, is already kind of literally impossible. On top of all that, <laughs> having all these distractions makes it even harder. So, um, so stick to the path, you know, and give your parasympathetic nervous system a little bit of love.